All right. Good afternoon. Hello. How's everybody? Good. So last week I had some notes and I was going to do, a, I thought, at least one staff meeting off it, maybe two. And I have like 25 points on the notes, and I got through three of them last week. <laughs> so let's go over those three. Then I'm going to talk really fast, so if my mouth catches on fire, somebody grab some water. And <laughs> um, we won't talk about this. Anybody remember? Don't answer. Just tell me, do you remember what the word chiropractic means? Yes. Uh, Raise your hand if you do. <laughs> OK, who wants to take a chance and give me the answer? Uh, chiro meant hand, I think, and practic meant practice. All right. Well done. Right. She's correct. So, uh, huh? <laughs> so we talked about the vertebrae and the disc and the nerve comes out of here, right? And you get a misaligned vertebrae and it gets stuck by what kind of tissue? Scar. Scar, Scar tissue, right? Yeah. So this is called a vertebral subluxation where it gets stuck. So if you hear these chiropractors we work with using that term, subluxation, it's this complex that we discussed where the vertebrae gets stuck and it stops sending the information to the brain and the disc starts dehydrating and it can herniate and cause all kinds of problems. It can even cause cervical radiculopathy. So, which is a whole other term. Yeah, cervical is neck. I was asked today, what's cervical radic radiculopathy? Cervical is neck. And radiculopathy means it radiates on the nerve. It's pathology that radiates, radiculopathy. Uh -huh. So you, those people usually get it in their hands. Somebody with lumbar radiculopathy usually get it in their legs. Because yeah. that's where the nerves go. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. What I'm trying to do is give you guys data so when you hear these terms and people talk to you, you're like, oh, I know what that is. Yeah. Right? So, um, so. We're looking at all this, and we're, we're doing the subluxation model in my clinic in Pennsylvania. And I, I really was impassioned by it. My, um, where's Nick? What's, what's the, the term? Subluxation model? Oh, the subluxation model is where your practice is based upon treating the subluxation only. Hmm. Does that make sense? Like a, uh, like a symptom model would be somebody comes in, and they say, well, I'll give you an example. I won't use any names, but I just talked to a client who's having a rough time. and. Um, this person said, well, you know, I, I treat people and I tell them to come back when it hurts. And I'm like, don't you do a care plan? No. Well, you know, people don't want that. Okay, well, you know, you're not a friend, you're a doctor. And a doctor tells people what they need, not what they want. So um, a, a symptom-based model would be come in when it hurts and I'll treat you in chiropractic. And a subluxation-based model is I'm going to work on that subluxation until I know it's better. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about symptoms. Good segue. And, and how it affects a condition or a disease. So how many of you ever seen the disease timeline? OK, so you people cannot answer these questions. So in our book that we're writing, <laughs> once in your sleep maybe, in our book that we're writing, we talk an awful lot about uh, health care. These are. Dry erase, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so healthcare is basically focused on disease. So this is a disease timeline. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is the day the disease starts. And this is as time goes on. And this is the day the disease ends. Now, I came up with this timeline to explain to people how our viewpoint needs to change and how we look at disease to make it better. Healthcare, not just chiropr some chiropractors, but primary healthcare is focused on what? Symptoms. Symptoms, right. So when somebody has a disease and it starts this day, do they know when they get the disease right away? No. No. And then on the day it ends, what usually happens on that day? They die. Okay, so um, some of you heard me say this part of it recently. I used to say, um, I didn't say this part, but I started saying it because I've been asking that question for 10 years. And I've asked 10,000 people easily, what happens on that day? And so far, two people say, you get cured. And everybody else says, you die. That's one viewpoint that has to change. Do you understand that? Yeah. So you might be the people who are talking to the doctors who talk to the people. You need to be able to talk to these doctors and say, the body can heal. That is a concept that most people don't even remember anymore. The body can heal, right? So 
How many people in here ever broke a bone? Raise your hand. Just two or three, four? One. Five. Okay, so for those people, raise your hand. Did it tickle or did it hurt? <laughs> so the thing that hurts about a broken bone is a little layer of nerves that surround the bone called the periosteum. And when you break a bone, it excites those nerves beyond belief. You know what the job of the periosteum is? To grow the bone back together. So the pain is your body healing itself. Now those who wrote, broke a bone, raise your hand again. When you broke the bone, did the doctor grow it back? It was my toes, so like they... Can't do anything for a toe. Yeah. I've done lots of toes. I used yeah. to do martial arts. Can't do anything for a toe. Yeah. Just got to bear with it, right? Wow. That's what they do. Can't do anything for a toe. Why? Because there's nothing to brace it to. Can't do anything for a toe. It was extremely, extremely painful. Oh, yeah. And it's like... Right? Can't oh, get the shoe back I'm on. I'm getting grossed out just thinking about it. <laughs> huh? Do what? I'm getting grossed out just remembering it. Yeah. Well, break, breaking a bone is very painful, but it's the healing process that makes it painful. So we got to shift the way we look at disease. So, for example, hey, Jared. <laughs> is he going like this behind my head? <laughs> so let's look at this. Are you sure it's the snapping process that's painful when you break a bone? Well, that's the gross out part. No, but like afterwards, it really hurts, right? Absolutely. Trust me, I've broken this bone, this bone, this bone, my spine, my foot, my toes, the fingers. Seriously, I've broken lots of bones. So it hurts. I've never had a broken bone where it didn't hurt. So when you look at a disease timeline, somebody gets a disease, what makes them go to the doctor? Do they know on day one, I got to go to the doctor? What do they have to experience to go to the doctor? Symptoms. Symptoms. So where does that first symptom usually occur? In the later half. How many say here? And how many say here? And how many won't raise their hand? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so let's try that again. How many say this part is where the symptom shows up? And how many say this part is where the symptom shows up? Okay, so let me give you some data, and I'll ask that question again. Okay? Does anybody in here know the leading cause of death in the United States? Except for Eric. Cardiovascular. cardiovascular disease. So 650,000 Americans on average die of cardiovascular disease every year in this country. 325,000 of those people approximately, which is 50%, all had the same first symptom. What was it? A heart attack. The heart attack that killed them. So the first symptom, sudden death, is 50% of the leading cause of death in the United States. So the first symptom of the leading cause of death in the United States starts right there. <laughs> They're all blue. Somebody's messing with me. Let's make them all blue. <laughs> OK. What's the second leading cause of death in the United States? Cancer. Cancer. Raise your hand if you knew somebody had cancer. First of all, it's appalling that everybody raised their hand. Because 40 years ago, you know what the cancer rate was? <coughs> One in 40. You know what it is today? Four. One in three. Wow. One in three people will get cancer in this country. So you look at this and you go, you're all qualified to answer this question. Where on this timeline do you get symptoms from a tumor? Can you have a tumor and not have symptoms at all? Yeah. Yeah. For how long? Yeah. yeah. So we're lucky if the second leading cause of death or almost any disease, the symptom shows up right here. Because when you go to the doctor is when your chance of fixing that disease starts depending on the doctor you go to, but that's when you're actually trying to handle the problem. And then we're lucky if it's the last 10% of the disease. So this is where Americans are working on treating their disease, where the symptoms are. Now, if you have a symptom, let's say you get a symptom from chronic degenerative arthritis, what's the doctor going to give you? A painkiller. Let's cover up the symptom. Is that going to fix anything? No. Do painkillers fix anything? No. How about anti-inflammatories? No. no. Is inflammation good or bad? Yeah. It can be good, isn't it? It can be both. Okay, mixed crowd. So, huh? <laughs> what about marijuana? <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> Tell him to be quiet. Since it's being counted as a big cure-all now, I'm not going to get into that because I only have 25 more minutes. But there is a difference between the oil that comes from hemp and marijuana. Yes. But inflammation, that's a sign, that's like a, a signal that the body's giving to help repair itself. Right? He's on the right track, but let me treat it, or let me teach you a little bit. 
more accurately. So let's say this room is a muscle cell, and every chair is a muscle, and every chair is a muscle cell, right? How do you get nutrients into the cells? Blood. blood. What's flowing in the blood? Oxygen, nutrients from your food, it all gets digested, it's in your bloodstream. So the blood's coming down this artery here, which is a big vessel, and then there's branches off of that vessel, we'll just make it simple and say they're capillaries, which are tiny little vessels. And in between every cell, there's a capillary. And the red blood cells are the ones carrying the oxygen and the nutrients, and they turn and fit down that little capillary. And the way it works is it has to be small enough that the red blood cell is rubbing, I mean, the, the, cap, the, yeah, the red blood cell is rubbing up against the muscle cells. And as they cross along, there's an exchange. This mu the muscle cell goes, oh, there's oxygen, I need that, and it pulls in, and the blood cell goes, oh, there's carbon dioxide, I need that, and pulls it out. You understand that? It's called osmosis. Yeah. So it has to be that it's small enough for that red blood cell to rub up against both sides. Everybody with me? Yeah. So if you damage part of this muscle, what kind of blood cell is going to fix it, red or white? Red. White. White. Red, white. white. red carries the fuel, white carries the repair crew. Yeah. So which one's bigger, red or white? twice as big. So how do they fit in? Inflammation. Inflammation. They push the cells apart. They make it swollen so the bigger blood cells can go in there and repair it. And what do we do when we have inflammation? We take a drug to stop it. So if you, if you were at our convention about a year ago, we had Dr. Keith Bjork, an orthopedic surgeon, he said, I think they should change the name of those drugs to stop the healing drugs because that's what they do. You're giving up the symptom at the expense of giving up healing. Do you understand that? Chronic inflammation. Sometimes there is a method necessary, or there's a necessity for that method to be used. Okay. Sometimes. But it's one, probably the most widely consumed drug in the United States, or one of them. You know, I mean, they're sold over the counter at, yeah, yeah, at convenience stores. So, like, we're well, way overdoing it. Why huh? are they doing it? I mean, what was the original I mean, marketing dollars? Dollars? Well, here's how a drug company works. Um, a drug company works on something, and they come up with a drug, yeah. and they realize, oh, here's the side effects. Oh, we could market those side effects. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. There was a drug that was made for heart disease, mm -hmm. and what it was trying to do is trying to divert blood away from certain areas and stop inflammation and divert it to other areas, increase, hopefully to the heart, get blood flow into the heart, right? But it didn't flow to the heart. In fact, it caused heart attacks. Where did it flow? to the male genitalia. Oh, wow. So what they call that drug? Viagra. 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 It was a heart drug, and it sent blood to the wrong part of the body. That's not a, I'm not making that up. And its side effect is heart attacks, which is if you watch the ads, and if you have a heart condition, check with your doctor before you. Yeah. That's the way it goes. That's how drugs are invented. Oh, wow, this thing stopped inflammation. Yeah, but it killed the patient. Yeah, but it stopped inflammation. We could market that. So that's how it works. So we have to change this viewpoint. We have to start thinking in terms of what's the cause of the problem. So thinking like this, my practice grew and grew and grew and grew in Pennsylvania. I was doing 100 visits a week, then I went to 200 visits a week. Now, does anybody know what the average is for a chiropractor? 200? Two, uh, only 20% of chiropractors, and I heard this stat from a couple sources, but only 20% of chiropractors ever see more than 200 in a week. So then I went to 300. Then I went to 400. And at 425, Colleen said, you're going to kill yourself. You need to get an associate. Because I was doing that all by myself. And I was only open four days a week. Because I was working my ass off. And I needed three days to recover. <laughs> so anyway, so what happened was I hired an associate, and we went over 500. I hired another associate, Dr. Morris. How many of you met Dr. Morris? And we went, over, we went up to 700. So we're doing 700 visits a week in one practice. It was. The nickname of our practice in Pennsylvania by other practices, including medical, was the Empire. That was our nickname. People would say to my staff, oh, you work for the Empire. <laughs> so, but I'm seeing all these patients, and I'm going, I don't know if I'm actually getting to the whole cause. Yes, they had that subluxation. Yes, that was a problem. Yes, I saw miracles happening. But I didn't know, one, how long they've had it, and I didn't know when they were finished. I was kind of judging that or guessing at that. So I started doing research. And I started looking up what happens to somebody when they have a subluxation. So you just got to bear with me on this because this is important. Even if we just get through this one point for the rest of this uh, um, staff meeting, it'd be worth for you guys to know it because you're going to talk to people on the phone.
that are dealing with the same thing or don't know they're dealing with the same thing. So patients would come in and they'd say, Doc, my back hurts. Do something for my back. Well, how long has it been going on? Well, a couple months. What have you done for it? This, 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 this. this is what, like doctor questions, right? Well, what's wrong? How long, what have you done for it? And what, what started it? And I'd say, so what started it? And they'd go, I don't know. Like 90% of the time, did you see the same thing? Yeah. What caused it? I bent over to tie my shoe and I couldn't stand back up again. I got out of bed in the morning and I couldn't stand back up again. Like the weirdest stories. So I'm thinking, that did not cause this problem. And then I'd look at their x-rays. Remember I showed you what happens with arthritis? What happens to the disc? It gets smaller because it dehydrates. What happens to the knee? The space gets smaller. Then the bones start changing. Spurs start forming. And I'm looking at that going, there's no way this started two months ago. There's no way this guy injured that bending over to tie a shoe two months ago. And I'd say to him, you injured yourself. And I'd get, no, I didn't. That's what I hear about all the time. How'd you get injured? I never got injured. I'm thinking to myself, so you learned how to walk and ride a bike and climb a tree and never fell down. But I didn't say that to them, but I'm just thinking it doesn't make sense. But what I figured out was this. When I had their x-ray up in front of them, and I'm going, see this? See this, Mike? This is right here. And you see how these vertebrae right here are all normal, and then that one is small? That's this one. And the nerve that comes out of there goes down here, and you have problems with your neck, your shoulder, and your elbow. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, the problem is you got 20 years of degeneration there. How did that happen? I don't know. I was going to ask you. <laughs> so what happened to you 20 years ago? Oh, yeah. I was in a really bad car accident. That's exactly what it would happen. They look at the x-rays. I give them an estimation. Sometimes I get, well, it wasn't 20 years ago. It was like 17 years ago. And I go, well, yeah, that's the one. So here's some of the stories, literally, that I heard. After people told me I never got injured, well, I was standing on a train, and I was riding on a train. And I didn't know I was going to be in a train accident. And next thing you know, I'm flying through the air and I smashed my face on the door of the opposite end of the car. Do you think that's what did that to my neck? <laughs> Seriously. Here's another one. I was in a Jeep in World War II that blew up. I was like, well, what happened? I don't know. I was unconscious. <laughs> or here's the best one. I was a paratrooper in World War II, and it was a new science, and I jumped out of a plane at 900 feet in a practice jump over Alabama, and my chute didn't open. And I said, what, the, what happened? This is exactly how it went. This guy is this tall. He's airborne, right? He's 75 years old at the time. And I go, what happened? He goes, what the hell do you think happened? I hit the ground. I bounced 30 feet in the air. I spent a year in a hospital. Well, I could have been there nine months, but I was sneaking out to go get some beer in that bar between my legs, and I fell down the steps, and I separated. I'm like, you're an animal. <laughs> But these are stories I've heard. But the most common one was? Injury. What kind? Car accident. Would you, car accident. So that's why I asked you the other day, how many people in this room have not been in a car accident? There's only two of you, I think, right? Mm. So that's what happens to people. They get in that force equals mass times acceleration type of injury, and it sets them up for stuff 10 or 20 years later, sometimes 30 years. Do you understand that? So I'm realizing I'm treating something that's 30 years old. This guy thinks I'm treating something that's two months old. He wants me to get him out of my office in like a week. That ain't going to happen, right? So I had to figure out a way to fix him. I had to figure out a way to know it was wrong. So we started looking at different doctors. And it was mostly medical doctors that we looked at. One of them was a guy named Rene Callier. Now, do you remember what Dr. Eric said last week about the bowling ball yeah. Yeah. here yeah. versus here? Yeah. Well, that was work by Dr. Callier. Dr. Callier said, if your head goes forward from the gravity weight line here to here, you go from using the energy to hold up a 12-pound head to a 30-pound head. Wow. If you go two more inches, now you're holding up a 42-pound head. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what he said was, when you injure any part of your spine, the very first, even if it's down here, the very first thing your body does is shift your head forward. Now, you remember in that picture I drew last week of the vertebrae? It's kind of like this. I just erased it. I should have left it up. <laughs> These are called facets. And I said they're the weight-bearing part of the spine. So it matches up like that, and a joint forms here. So because that becomes the painful part of the subluxation, Dr. Callier said the first thing you do is shift your head forward, which transfers the weight from here to here. Do you understand that? And this bone is softer bone than this. So it can morph. And what will happen is if you shift your weight onto it, it'll start to take on this type of shape, which does this. 
So as you go through life, when you see people get older like this, that is yeah. not normal. That is because they had an injury to their spine and they shifted. And when they shifted, now it caused more problems, so they shifted more and it kept a process going. So ending up like this is not inevitable. It is because you had something that wasn't fixed. So I went, this is what I need to be working on. So then I came upon another doctor named Dr. Yanda. Anybody ever hear of him? He's another medical doctor. And what he said was, if Callier was correct, if you shift your head forward, you're now using different muscles to hold your body up. So what he said was, both of them said, the side effect of having an untreated spine, number one, is poor posture. Now, is poor posture an aesthetic thing or a medical thing? Medical. Depends on, it's both. If you ask a patient, they go, it's aesthetic. Because a patient, when they look in the mirror, they don't go, do I have nerve interference? <laughs> or do they go, am I getting like this? Am I getting fat? Am I getting like this? That's what people do. So what I tell our clients is, you want to get somebody in your office, start talking about posture and not nerve interference. Do you understand that? It's more of a motivator to get a person in the office. So what, Cal or what Yanda said was, if you use the wrong muscles, you're going to have pain in those muscles, which is what brings most of the people in. Most of the patients that I saw when they came in my office were complaining of muscle pain. When they had nerve pain, that was a whole different game. Nerve pain was, don't put a gun in this room, because if you walk out, I'm picking that gun up and putting it in my mouth. Um, remember I gave the toothache analogy? How bad a toothache can be? That's nerve pain. And if you take a toothache on the size of a nerve that's the size of a pestle point, and you transfer it to your sciatic nerve, which is the size of your thumb, that's a lot of pain, right? But most of the patients I saw, 80% were muscle pain. And the muscle pain can be pretty devastating too, but it's because they're using the wrong muscles to hold themselves up. When your spine is like this, you have muscles along the spine that hold them up, and they're designed to do that. But when you shift forward, you start using muscles of exercise and movement to hold yourself up, and they're not designed to do that. So what's the difference? You'll let me know when we're up, right? What, I got seven, seven minutes? Yeah. Okay, so just hang with me on this. Don't get overwhelmed on this. You have four kinds of muscle in your body. Cardiac, what's that? Cardiac. Okay, that's one. Then there's smooth, what's that? Like face smooth. smooth is organs, intestines. Who said that, Chase? Very good. It's organs, so don't worry <laughs> about that. Then there's two types of musculoskeletal muscles, what everybody thinks of muscles, right? Did you know organs were actually muscular? No. That's how your intestines can push food through. Do you understand that? So the two types of musculoskeletal muscles are postural and phasic. So phasic is for movement. It's for like picking something up or exercising, right? Postural is for holding your posture. Postural muscles are real tiny little muscles, and phasic muscles are usually very big muscles, right? So if I were to take this bowling ball and hold it here, and then put it out here. I'm using posture or phasic muscles to do that, right? Using my bicep, and it's, I'm not gonna last long. Like maybe <laughs> if I'm good, 20 more seconds? No, not even. Because I'm using the wrong muscles. Although I could pick that ball up and throw it, even if you had a big bodybuilder in here, they could probably hold it out, but then after a while they'd start changing the way they're standing because they're using different muscles. So a, a, fa a phasic muscle is not designed to hold you up. It's designed to be strong, but it can only hold a contraction for a very short period of time. Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. The muscles along your spine are not very strong, but they're designed to hold a contraction all day long. Anybody, how many people here stayed up all night in college just to study? Raise your hand. <laughs> and what happens at the end of the second day? Like you take the test and you're out having a beer with your friends and you're like, yeah. Huh? <laughs> it's because you've been using your postural muscles for 36 hours and you're starting to go, enough is enough, go to sleep, right? So when we're working on these people, what they're doing is they're damaging the postural muscles and recruiting the phasic muscles. They're using the muscles designed for short energy to hold themselves up. And they develop knots. You know what they call those knots? Trigger, Trigger points. You guys get it? So if you ever have somebody come over and they check you out and they go, hey, oh, you got a trigger point right there. Let me work on that. And you go like, oh, it feels so good. It's because they're telling a muscle that's not supposed to be contracted to relax, right? And when you do that, if it comes back in that same spot, you're probably going through this. Do you understand that? Yeah. So
So that's what we did. The rehab program we designed in our office was to undo those trigger points, right? So it's a series of exercises and stretches. How many of you have seen the videos on our website of the exercises and stretches? Okay, well, if you look at it, they're basically designed to find the muscles that are too tight, which are usually the phasic muscles, and stretch them out, and then find the muscles that are too weak, which are usually the postural muscles, and strengthen them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what happens to a lot of people is they'll say, hey, people are looking at me saying, are you taller? <laughs> and the reason they're taller is because they're standing straighter. Do you understand that? Yeah. So what we do is we measure these muscles and the strength and tightness of them every two weeks. That's how we do our exams. And what we found is it takes an average of 8 to 10 to 12 weeks of three times a week to fix that on most people. Sometimes a little longer, but it's usually that long. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when people say, you're going to hear chiropractors say, oh, I don't recommend three times a week. That's just too much. I always go, really? Based on what? Because I'm measuring, and it tells me that's the frequency I need to do. And they're not measuring. They're guessing. Yeah. Right? And then they accuse the people who measure of, oh, just trying to make money. No, we're actually doing a more scientific treatment. So the AMI whole program is based on the core of what I just taught you in the last half hour. The whole program. I'll give you an example. We can do some injections, which is into a trigger point, where the medical doctor doesn't take a cortisone. You guys heard of cortisone? Yeah. The reason they use cortisone is cortisone shrinks up inflammation like that. So if you have an inflamed joint and they inject it, their goal is to get you out of pain. But what it does is it damages the tissue. But if you take that needle and you go into a muscle, let's say here's the muscle, right? And here's the trigger point right in the middle. It's all real tight right there. And you take a needle, and you go right into that. They don't do one injection. They go that direction, then that direction, then that direction, then that direction. They're putting fluid in there, which is very safe, no side effects. And the fluid expands in the tissue and breaks the scar tissue. Remember I asked you last week which is more brittle and which is more flexible? The scar tissue is brittle. When you put fluid in there, it breaks the scar tissue. And we're going to end on this one. So here's the joint. Remember I drew this picture of the joint last week? Had a bone like that? Yeah. If you put a needle in there and you fill it full of lidocaine, it's going to push that joint apart. It's like inflating a tire. All the scar tissue in that capsule is going to start to break. Do you understand that? Yeah. So we're not doing these injections just to make money. We're doing them because it reverses arthritis. If you do that with a stem cell, not only does the fluid go in there, but the stem cells go to work and start replacing the cartilage and the ligaments and sometimes the bone. Do you understand that? Yeah. So everything that we put together in this model was for reversing the process that I explained to you over the last three weeks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions? I have a question. How do you, do you get the time right on, you know, on people that had injuries? <laughs> was that just experience? Um, just looking at... When I moved from Georgia, or Pennsylvania to Georgia, which was in 2004, I tried to count how many sets of x-rays I looked at, and I stopped counting at 55,000. Wow. <laughs> and we did that by taking a number of new patients we've seen over the years that we were open. So I've seen a lot of x-rays. I'm not the smartest guy, but eventually if you throw enough mud against the wall, some of it starts to stick. <laughs> I just had a lot of mud thrown at me. But that's how. And I would get it wrong. They'd go, no, it wasn't 20 years ago. It was like 15 or is 30. Okay.